Hola amigos! In today's tutorial, I'll explain how to achieve this edge detection effect using a post-process shader. Although we had a quick look at a simpler version of this same effect in a previous video, there were a couple requests to go into this in more detail, so thanks to James Morfor and the rest of you who post comments below, that's the best way to let me know what you want to see next. The shader is quite configurable, but has some limitations. The way we detect the edges breaks a little bit on objects with sharp edges when the thickness of the lines is set to too high, but under most conditions it looks pretty clean and it's not too expensive on the GPU. I also added optional line color based on the custom depth stencil buffer, which can be used to highlight objects in your project. To make it work, you will have to enable this buffer, which can be done from the project settings window search for stencil or custom depth and set the custom depth stencil pass to enable with stencil. This allows us to write a custom value from 0 to 255 on any mesh which can be used later in our shader. Before we move on to the graph, let me explain how the edge detection algorithm works. This is a convolution kernel. A kernel or convolution matrix is a set of values that, when applied to an image in a certain way, called convolution, can be used for many visual effects, such as blurring, sharpening, edge detection, and many more. Here's how it works. For every pixel in our image, we're going to put this matrix center on it, and then multiply the value of each pixel for the number in the matrix, and finally adding all together. We'll see better with an example. In this image, black is a value of 0 and white is 1. If we want to detect an edge on this pixel, we need to multiply its value and all the adjacent pixels by the numbers in the matrix. If we do that and add the total together, we have a result of 0, meaning no edge. However, if we repeat the same operation on this pixel, the final result is 1, representing an edge. This particular kernel is called a Laplacian, and since it only needs 5 sample values, including the center, it's relatively cheap, but has some problems with sharp corners. We can modify it to include the diagonals, as you can see in the Photoshop custom filter, but for this example, we'll stay with the simpler version. Now we're ready to find the edges in our image, but we cannot just apply the filter to the final render, since that would produce lots of unwanted lines from textures, shadows, and any other high contrast areas. Instead of that, we're going to generate an image using the geometry information from the normal and dev buffers. Before looking at the nodes, we'll have to change the material properties by clicking either on the output node or any empty space in the graph. Set the material domain to post process and then the blendable location to after tone mapping. This will change the order in which this pass will be run and it is necessary to avoid this temporal aliasing artifact. As I explained earlier, we're going to detect edges in the image by running our Laplacian filter over a combination of the world normal and dev buffers. We cannot use only the normal buffer, because parallel areas, even if they are distant, will have the same color, as we can see on the preview. Similarly, we cannot only use the depth buffer, because closed meshes wouldn't show edges. The solution is to use a vector with the first two components equal to the red and green components of the normal buffer, and the third one equal to the base 10 logarithm of the depth value. We're using the logarithm here because it will start small, giving us more depth detail on close objects. Let me connect this new vector to the output for a moment, so we can see this effect in the actual scene. Now we have an image with very nice separation of messes by color. 
It might be hard to appreciate them in the video, but the filter can definitely see those subtle color differences from the depth component, and that will be enough to find some of the otherwise more tricky edges. This vector is a critical part of our shader, and will appear a few more times, so remember, the first two components are the same as the normal buffer, and the third component is the base 10 logarithm of the depth buffer. Going back to our Laplacian filter explanation, this would represent the center pixel. Next, we need to sample these values again, but on the adjacent pixels to it. In this first section of the graph, we're going to calculate the UV offsets as follows. First, we'll multiply the base coordinate offsets 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, and 0, minus 1 by the inverse of the texture size to correct the scale, and then multiply each of those by a new constant parameter that we can use to increase the thickness of the lines to a certain extent. Then, we'll need to add each result to a default texture coordinate node. This will be used on the UV input on the following samplers. Now we need to repeat the same operations that we did before, the base 10 logarithm of the depth buffer component and the red and green components of the normal buffer, combined into a single vector. But this time, use the UV offsets that we calculated before for each one of the four copies of each sampler node. The final step of the filter is to add all the offset vectors together and then subtract the result from the center value, multiplied by 4. If we output this node, we can see a pretty good edge detection effect already. However, it still has a couple of issues. First, the colors are still those from our sample target. And second, we can add a few more parameters to allow more fine-tuning of the effect. The first issue is easy to solve, by using the magnitude of the vector instead of the vector itself. As for parameters, the first one I will add is a factor to bump or reduce the fainter lines and control the sensitivity of the filter. This is done easily by comparing it with the vector length using a step node. Although here it might look like it just made the lines thicker, if we zoom in the preview, we can see that it's just more of the fine normal details on the sphere showing up. After using a 1- minus node to invert the result, I'll add the next custom parameter, which is going to make the effect fade over distance. This can be a nice way to reduce line clutter and produce a cleaner final image. Here's how it works. First, we need to divide the depth, the base value, by this parameter. Then, divide the result of the 1- minus by this. Now our edges disappear after that distance, allowing us to remove the edges from the background elements. To combine this mask with the final image, we'll use a linear interpolation node. In the first input, the RGB mask of the post-process input 0 a scene texture. On B, we'll stick a constant zero just for now. And finally, use the line mask as the alpha. This looks great. The lines are clean and crisp, the distant fade gives it a very nice soft look, and there are almost no edges missing. We can still add a little more functionality to it though. The first and simplest thing is to replace the constant zero from earlier with a vector parameter to allow control of the color. And I'm not doing it here, but you could use the alpha value of this parameter to control the global opacity of the filter as well. The next and final bit is entirely optional, since you might not need it, or you might be achieving the same effect in a different pass. It will allow us to have up to 255 IDs that we can assign to meshes to give them different edge line colors. At the beginning of the video, I enabled the custom dev stencil buffer, and this is the reason why. If I select any of these static meshes and search for custom on the property panel, there are two interesting values. 
render custom dev pass and custom dev stencil value. I have it enabled it for both of them and set their IDs to 1 and 2 respectively. We can see these IDs if we toggle on the custom stencil buffer visualization on the view mode menu. Before we move on, I want to show something important to know. The stencil buffer is not occluded. That is why we can still see the ID numbers even when these objects are behind the wall. While this can be useful for other effects, I don't want the stencil lines to appear in front of other lines when they should not. We can solve this using the custom dev stencil buffer, which renders the dev buffer only for those objects with the property turned on. If we subtract the scene depth from the custom depth and then remove all the negative values, what we have remaining is an inverted mask of the properly occluded stencil buffer, which we can correct with a 1- node. Outputting this value on our scene, we can see that now the two objects with the custom depth pass enabled are properly rendered behind other geometry. All that remains now is to add the individual colors for the defined stencil values. We'll start by sampling the custom stencil buffer with a scene texture node, masking the red component and then dividing by 255 to convert the number into a 0 to 1 range. Next, for each color that we want to define, we need to use a bit mask function between the previous result and each one of our stencil IDs. For this example, I'll stick with only 1 and 2. Now, we just need to multiply these masks by colors, and then multiply them again by the depth mask. Finally, mix it with the original line color. A better way to combine these colors is using another linear interpolation instead of adding them together, but if your baseline color is black, this way is slightly more efficient and it doesn't make a difference. And with that, we are done for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what effect or game feature would you like to see examined next. See you next time!